listen to it. Most of them are up there. Oh, and there's there's gunfire in the background because somebody's watching television very loudly. Well, hopefully it won't pick up. Okay. Hello, I am reading from the book, by the book, by Michelle Baker and Lori Cole. And this is chapter 22, Disillusionment. Hawk waited impatiently at the inn, but by the time Falcon returned with the dispel potion, the sun was nothing more than a slice of crimson above the craggy horizon. Despite his eagerness, Hawk knew better than to go bear hunting at night. Sleep, however, was impossible. He slipped off his boots and made himself comfortable, seating himself cross-legged on the bed with his back against the headboard. Using a torn-off piece of an old shirt, he began to polish the flat of his sword to a mirror finish. When the sword gleamed brighter than the looking glass in the corner, Hawk sheathed it and picked up his hero Nuhayan book. By now, he knew every word of it by heart, so he looked at the pictures. All of the heroes depicted in the book were well-dressed and groomed. He found himself wishing that he had time to have some finery made for his triumphant visit to the castle. He looked at the book for a while, put it down, paced, polished his sword some more, then picked up the book again. At last, just before dawn, he dozed off, only to wake again in cold sweat, dreaming that he'd found the bear's head displayed at the wall of the Adventures Guild. Rising from his bed, Hawk looked out the window and saw that a grayish light began to filter over the town wall. Out of habit, he prepared to wake his siblings, but then decided this is something he would rather do on his own. Since he'd never bothered to undress, he put his boots back on and smoothed down his hair, then slipped out of the inn. Upon leaving town through the west gate, he began to walk faster propelled by a strange energy. All the way, he recited what he would say to the baronet, over and over so he would not forget. Only when he reached the cave did he slow down, smoothed his hair once again, and took a deep, few deep breaths. He coughed, retied his shoes, and brushed a stray fur needle from his shirt. Then he reached into his bag and pulled out the dispel potion which glowed a lurid pink in the cloudy morning light. Hawk corked the bottle and, with one last muttered recitation of his introductory speech, entered the cave with the potion in hand. It seemed darker in here than it had been the last time, and it certainly smelled worse. Hawk heard the bear stirring and realized that it would swallow him whole before his eyes adjusted. Quickly, he backed out of the cave. The bear lumbered out of the cave after him as though sizing him up as a lunch option. This was it. This was the moment. Hawk felt a hot rush of panic as he realized how many things could go wrong. What if this really wasn't the baronet? What if the healer had messed up somehow in making the potion? What if... No. No, he had to stop thinking and act. Hawk steeled himself to wait until the bear was close enough. Nothing would be worse than throwing the whole bottle of potion over on the, on the ground and then being eaten. The bear loped after Hawk, then reared up, preparing to knock him down. Hawk qui quickly splashed the potion at the bear, groping for his sword in case the magic didn't work. With a tremendous bellow, the bear fell back on all fours. Virulent fuchsia smoke curled off of its hide where the potion had touched it. For a moment, Hawk was sure that Amelia had read her recipe wrong and he was going to have to cope with a very angry, smoking, pink bear. But then the bear shuddered violently and Hawk watched in astonishment as the potion began to work. The bear's form rippled, convulsed, stretched, and shrank. Fur melted into dingy pinches of clothing. Paws became hands. The bear's snout shrank into a face that was decidedly human, mouth open wide in pain and surprise. Hawk found himself gazing in wonder at a young man only a few years older than himself. It had to be Bernard. 
the stranger possessed the handsome symmetry of bone structure associated with nobility. Looking closer, Hawk saw that the amulet around his neck bore the crest of Sigvord, twin loffers rampant on a feed field of azure. When the transformation was complete, Barnard let out a cry and dropped to his knees, looking dizzy and confused. Hawk's first instinct was to rush forward and help him, then thought better of it. It would be disrespectful to lay hands on the heir of Sigborg without permission. What? the young man said after a moment, putting his hands to his head. What have you done? Where are we? Hawk executed a bow so deep that his nose nearly touched his boots. You're magnificent! Baronet Barnard von Sigborg, he said, just as he had practiced all the way there. I am Hawk, an adventurer from the Western Mountains. You were turned into a bear by the wicked Baba Yaga, and I, Hawk, have restored you to your true form. Barnard stared for a long moment, seeming to take in Hawk's clothing and appearance. The confusion in the baronet's dark eyes were quickly replaced by a strange coolness. Slowly he stood, brushing himself off. You claim we were an animal and that you restored us to our present form? Hawk looked around to see who else Barnard might be referring to and then belatedly re remembered the royal we. The book hadn't said anything about its use by lesser nobility, but perhaps customs were different here. It is kind of hard to believe, isn't it? Hawks said with a sheepish smile. His smile was not returned, and he bowed again, embarrassed. I wouldn't have believed it myself if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. But, um, you were a, a very impressive bear. Is that so? said the baronet in a strange tone. Something about his manner bothered Hawk, but he couldn't quite place it. We ask again, said Barnard, seeming to come to himself. Where are we? Um, Hawk straightened. Uh, this is a cave. You were, um, living here for a couple of years. Your, your castle is northeast of here a ways. Barnard glanced at the cave, and a muscle in his jaw twitched slightly. Then he flipped a hand idly in Hawk's direction. You may go now. Hawk's jaw dropped. Um, forgive me, you're a uh, uh, baronetcy, but will you be able to find your way back by yourself? Barnard looked around for a moment, then casually smoothed his oily dark hair back from his temples. Uh, we shall accompany you to your town, he said airily. We are not ungrateful for your attempts to aid us, and we shall protect you from the monsters and their ilk along the way. Now at least, Hawk appeared to be making some headway. Patience, he reminded himself. That poor guy's been through quite an ordeal. Hawk bowed for what felt like the hundredth time. I thank you for your kind office, offer, O oh, siphon of the house of Sigborg. The castle is this way. When Al arrived at the top of Zauberberg, sweaty and panting, he stopped just short of the Archmage's perch, porch and stared at the front entrance. Somehow, the sight of the closed red door sent a chill through him. He'd run out of diversions and excuses. One way or another, he was going to face the Archmage today. The idea didn't fill him with the excited anticipation he would have expected. Actually, he felt sick to his stomach. The gargoyle was clearly amused to see him. He who would Erasmus see first must answer questions three, the creature broomed. Go on, Al snapped, trying to take shallow breaths to avoid the cramp in his side. What is the language of magic? Good. The questions were the same each time. He had a chance of getting them to this place before he grew too old to climb the mountain. Runes, he said dutifully. Which is better, 
cider, or root beer? Oh, root beer, of course, said Owl, hoping that it sounded convincing. Who is the most powerful spellcaster who ever lived? Owl smiled in satisfaction. He heard Zara mention this on the very first day they met. Remembering, he started to say Irana, then stopped, feeling a sudden qualm of uncertainty. Sara hadn't wanted to admit that Irana was more powerful than she was. Would Erasmus share that same arrogance? After all, Irana wasn't even an archmage, as far as Al knew. Carol is by indecision halfway through his attempt to speak. Al coughed out something very much like Aranus. Correct, boomed the gargoyle, much to Al's amazement. With a horrible creaking sound, the great red door began to open slowly. Al felt his heart leap in his chest. At last, he was going to meet the archmage. He tried to enter, but he found his feet would not budge. This had nothing to do with magic, and quite a bit to do with sheer terror. Coward, taunted the gargoyle. A surge of irritation loosened Owl's limbs, and he passed through the door, giving a little shudder as his shadow passed directly over him. Go upstairs to the sitting room. Do not dally the gargoyle admonished from outside. Afraid of being sent down the mountain, Al continued ahead, much as he would have liked to linger and take in the spectacle of Erasmus's dimly lit entrance hall. The high ceilinged room was a roughly hexagonal in shape and filled with random mismatched antique furniture. A wardrobe, three leather armchairs with a roll-top desk, a sofa between the two dining tables, Every available surface was covered with paintings, knickknacks, oddments, and whatnots. As Al passed, a stuffed peacock startled him by spreading its tail feathers. Then there were the stairs, innumerable winding stairs. Apparently, if one wanted to be a, a magic user, one had to be physically as well as mentally fit. Torch flames flickered a dim violet as he climbed and the eyes of the archmage's paintings followed him. At last he reached the open doorway at the top of the stairway and passed through it into a brightly lit sitting room. An enormous window on the south wall admitted a spectacular view of Sigmar Valley. To Al's surprise, he found he could see every leaf of the landscape, even in this, from this distance. Sipping tea at the small round table by the window was an old man wearing an embroidered smoking jacket of an even more garish shade of purple than the tower itself. He was bald except for a few flyaway silver wisps and a long unruly gray beard. Dark eyes beneath scraggly brows sparkled with what appeared to be delight. Across from him on a stack of books sat a rat the size of a small dog wearing a pointed cap. The old man set down his tea and smiled broadly. Come in, owl. Come in. Have a seat. His voice sounded a bit creaky, but robust. As owl tentatively seated himself opposite the old man, the rat startled him by speaking. I'm Fenris, he squeaked, holding out a single pink paw for owl to shake. This is Erasmus, my familiar. Uh, shouldn't that be the other way around? snorted the old man. The rat looked at Erasmus blankly. Familiar is my Erasmus? Erasmus waved a hand dismissively, then turned back to Owl. So, he said, you want to be a wizard. Owl suddenly felt as though he was six years old. I want, he hesitated, then heard himself blurt, I, I want to be an archmage. Instantly, he was cringed with embarrassment. But when he looked up, he saw the old man beaming. Excellent. You certainly have the potential. I do? Owl said in astonishment. You might say it's written all over you, commented Fenris. 
Al tried to remain calm, despite the thrill that raced through him. It was true. Zara thought that you might be able to teach me, he said. I'll, I'll do whatever I must. I learn very quickly. I'm sure you do, said Erasmus. So how is it that I might help you? This was the last question Al had expected. He stared at Erasmus, and then at his hands. Uh, I don't know where to start, he admitted. Erasmus frowned. I wouldn't say that. You made it here, didn't you? You know that you have magical aptitude, and you know something about rune spells. It seems to me that you have made a fine beginning. You just got a rune with it, kid, quipped the rat. Al brightened. It's true. I do know a few rune spells, and I have this book. Al withdrew the book from his rep sack, holding it up to show Erasmus. Instantly, the old man's expression changed. May I see it? He said solemnly. Al was reluctant to let go of the book, but at the same time, he didn't want to offend the archmage. After a moment's hesitation, he handed it over. Erasmus gently ran his fingers along the cover, then carefully opened it. Marvelous, he said softly. Such layers of magic, such craftsmanship, so very beautiful. Erasmus's eyes became somewhat distant as he turned the pages. Fenris coughed uncomfortably. <laughs> Erasmus is a sucker for a good smell book, aren't you, Erasmus? Ah, uh, Erasmus? Erasmus looked up, awareness returning to his eyes. Oh, oh, yes, he said. Thank you, Al. As Erasmus moved to hand the book back, Al couldn't help but notice a trace of reluctance in the gesture. Can you tell me where it came from? Al said, relieved to have the book back in his hands. How I ended up with it. Erasmus hesitated. I could work a little Thinatory magic on it, he said. It shouldn't take more than a month or so. Why so long? said Al, instinctively pulling the book closer to his chest. All magical objects have their little secrets, said Erasmus. They can always be learned by one with great skill and power. Fenris rolled his eyes. But an object's magical defenses can sometimes be quite strong. Don't worry, though. Erasmus added in a reassuring tone. I very rarely botched a job of this sort. What happens if you botch it? said Al nervously. Kaboom! said Fenris pointedly. Explosions are actually quite rare, said Erasmus. If anything, it, it would more likely simply disintegrate. But you needn't worry. I feel fairly certain nothing like that would happen. Al looked at his book, ran his hand over the cover protectively. It's all right, he said after a moment. If the book wants to keep that badly to keep its secrets, I think I'll wait until I have the power to find them out myself. Erasmus chuckled, the twinkle returning to his eyes. Um, I noticed zap in your spell book, he commented. The pixie's protected rune spell. I take it you're acquainted with them? <laughs> we met said Al with a little smile, turning to the page in question. The rune spells seem to sort themselves into the back of the book, as opposed to the runes by themselves, which appeared at the beginning. Shocking experience, wasn't it? said Fenris merrily. Al studied the page thoughtfully. I don't know how to work this one yet, he said. I think it has lightning on it, but I can't make out the other rune. As he looked at the rune spell, he mentally erased the runes for lightning and spell, and was left with a strange, abstract, geometrical shape. I'm sure you'll get a feel for it, Al, said Fenris. You just gotta get in touch with its inner meaning, so to speak. Contact. Aided by Fenris's hints, the knowledge of the rune flooded Al with the by now familiar exhilaration. Hmm? Kids, quick! exclaimed Fenris, grinning toothily. Erasmus nodded, seeming pleased. Oh, you have a very fine started rune spell mastery with this book. You are aware of the requirements for becoming an archmage. 
Al closed his book and looked up, shaking his head. Well, first, you must become a mage. You already know five of the nine spells necessary for earning that title. Between your natural talent and that spell book of yours, you'll succeed in no time at all. A mage at an early age! Al felt his cheeks flush with pleasure. Can you teach me the other four spells? Erasmus huffed indignantly. <laughs> of course I can teach you four spells. I am an archmage, after all. Um, Erasmus, Fenris said softly, I think he means will you. Oh, said Erasmus cheerfully. Oh, that's another matter altogether. Far be it from me to spoil the thrill and excitement that comes from finding and learning new rune spells. In other words, kid, you're on your own. Al's heart sank to his feet. But you said... Then he stopped, afraid he understood. Despite the talk about his potential, in truth, he wasn't talented enough to be worth Erasmus's time. They were just too kind to say so, after all the trouble he'd gone through. Never mind, he said bitterly, rising from his chair. I, I won't bother you again. Erasmus just smiled brightly. It's no bother, is it, Fenris? It's rather refreshing to have someone new here with whom to chat. Come back any time. Al stared at the floor in embarrassment. It would be a great honor, he said, but it is a very difficult journey for me, especially if the only reason for making it was to relieve the Archmage's boredom. Nonsense, Al, said Erasmus. With the spells you already know, you can handle almost any danger that confronts you. <laughs> if you can bore a bear, then you can bear this boar. May I ask you something, Al said. I know I'm only a child, but I can face the truth. Why won't you teach me? Erasmus just stammered, looking shocked and chagrined. Fenris rolled his eyes. Ow! Erasmus only helps those who can't help themselves. So this part's yours to fill in. Ow looked at Fenris in puzzlement. You're saying that I don't need help? Bingo! cried Fenris. But how can that be? persisted Ow. <laughs> You've come along at such a fine pace so far, he said, Erasmus. You just have to find a few more rune spells, and then with plenty of practice and experience, we'll be calling you Mage Owl, the Sage Fowl. Suddenly, Owl felt a huge grin take over his face. He couldn't remember ever smiling so wide. He felt like his face would split in two. So I'm doing the right thing all along, he said. By George, I think he's got it, squeaked Fenris. Of course, added Erasmus. Fenris and I are always here to assist you with your practice. Yeah, why don't you come up and see us sometime? I will, I promise, said Owl, still fighting the smile that threatened to bisect his face. Thank you. Thank you, Archmage Rasmus. Fenris, with a respectful bow, Al took his leave. The baronet followed Hawk northward, complaining bitterly about the length of the walk. Hawk did feel a qualm of regret at not having Barnard's horse already, but he couldn't have handled the animal well enough to get a halter on it, let alone walk it all the way to the cave. This is intolerable. Barnard said as they last approached the west gate of Sigborg. Our father's men should be waiting at the town gates. Shall we walk through the town unescorted as though we were a peasant? Why didn't you announce that we would be returning? I wasn't sure if the potion would work, your lordship, said Hawk, still trying to get used to Barnard's odd use of the word we. I'll escort you there if you like. You overwhelm us with your generosity, said Barnard with icy sarcasm. Given that choice, we shall go alone. Hawk felt a throb in his temples. I have to 
to come through the gate anyway, my lord, said Hawk. I'm staying at the Hero's Tell Inn. Then count to a hundred before following, said Barnard, to put a proper distance between us. Hawk tried to speak, but all that came out were a few strangled sounds. Oh, we beg your pardon, said Barnard, seeming to come to a sudden realization. Hawk began to relax and opened his mouth to reassure Barnard, but the young baronet interrupted. Just you wait here. It hadn't occurred to us that perhaps you haven't learned to count. With that, the baronet turned on his heel and marched into the gate. Hawk had to count to 300 very slowly before he could enter the gate without risk of strangling the nearest bystander. Hawk, cried Sheriff Meisterson from the porch. Instead of his usual relaxed pose in this rocking chair, the old man was on his feet, looking agitated. Was that Baronet Barnard von Sigberg I just saw marching past here? Hawk sighed, lifting his gaze to meet the sheriff's. Yes, he said. Well, I'll be, said the sheriff in astonishment. His mouth flapped open and shut a few times, and then he sat down hard in his rocker. Well, I'll be, he said again. Hawk put his head down and continued walking. He didn't want to talk to anyone just yet. He wandered through the streets for a while, somewhat reluctant to return to the inn, and answered what he knew would be a barrage of questions. He leafed through his hero manual as he walked, looking for uplifting passages. Page 18 was quite encouraging. It clearly stated that consistently treating nobility with respect would eventually earn their favor. Hawk had managed not to lose his temper with Bernard, so surely his patience would pay off. Before Hawk realized it, the sun began to sink into the west. Quickly he snapped out of his melancholy mood and turned, returned his steps towards the inn. What if the Baron had tried to send word? At that thought, he picked up his pace. When he entered, he found his three siblings seated at the table in the main room, clearly on tender hooks. Shamin, Shima, and even Abdullah were also hovering nearby. Hawk hoped one of them would say he had a message for the Baron, but instead they all turned to look at him expectantly. Wren leaped from her chair. Hawk, she cried, running to him and giving him a hug. Did you do it? Did it work? Hawk glanced at Owl, who was also appeared intently interested in the answer. It worked, said Hawk, giving Wren a return squeeze. You should have seen it. It was spectacular. Owl nodded, apparently satisfied. Falcon just continued to watch Hawk, saying nothing. Wow, said Wren. I would like to see that. Was the baronet all naked when he got turned back? Hawk couldn't help grinning at the thought. He gave Wren a little nudge back towards the table and followed her. No, he had clothes. Very nice clothes. Suddenly he felt another stab of anxiety. I'm going to have to get some new clothes. Shamin pulled out a chair for Hawk, beaming. To think that I should have, as a guest at my inn, one capable of such wonders. Shima appeared at Hawk's side, side as he seated himself. He smiled at her, trying to fight the unpleasant feeling that kept gnawing at his gut. I, I could use something to eat, he said, realizing that he hadn't had a meal all day. Shima gave a little nod and disappeared into the kitchen. So, what was Barnard like? Wren persisted. Was he handsome and smart like the nobleman in your book? Oh, he's very handsome, said Hawk, enjoying the way Wren smiled at the news. Hard to say how smart he is, but... Because, you know, he was pretty confused after having been a bear for so long. Abdullah rose from his chair by the fire and lifted his hands to the sky. Blessings at last have showered upon us in this accursed place, he said dramatically, then sat down again as though his burst of happiness had exhausted him. Al refilled its cup of tea from the chipped blue and white china pot on the table. 
Did Barnard make arrangements for you to meet the Baron? He asked. Hawk wondered how much he should tell them. N not much, he decided, since he really didn't know himself. He hasn't gotten back to me about that yet, he said finally. Did he remember trying to eat me? said Wren. Hawk tried to keep a straight face. I didn't think it was polite to ask. Shima reappeared then with a tray of food. She'd obviously gone to a great deal of trouble. The bread was freshly baked, the stew chunkier, chunkier than usual, and there was a large glass filled with foaming dark golden liquid. Hawk looked at it curiously. Ale, cried Abdullah joyously from his chair. I obtained a pint for you this afternoon as we've been led to understand that it is the adventurer's beverage of choice. Inexplicably, Hawk felt a lump forming in his throat. Thank you, he said. He turned his attention quickly to his food, tearing off piece of the bread and dunking it into the wonderful smelling stew. When he lifted it to his lips, however, he found his mouth strangely dry. He tried to chew, but it was like having a mouthful of wool. He raised his glass to his lips to wash the bread down and nearly choked on the bitter stinging liquid. He forced himself to take a couple of swallows, then set the glass down and just stared at his bowl. What's wrong, Hawk? Fal Falcon said. These were the first words he'd spoken since Hawk's arrival. Wrong, said Hawk with a rush of guilt. Oh, well, nothing. I am think I'm just a little t tired from the adrenaline rush, that's all. So what happens now? Owl asked him. Um, the baronet or one of his people will be getting in touch soon, Hawk replied. Great, said Wren. Can we all go with you to the castle? Not without an invitation. Wren just smiled. You can get us an invitation. You're Barnard's best friend right now, after all. You're his hero. Hawk's stomach turned over, and he regretted having taken even one small bite of bread. Oh, I'm sure we'll be great friends, he said with a forced gaiety. Then he stood up abruptly. Oh, well, I, I think I need to go to bed. I'm sure I'll be hearing from the castle in the morning, so I want to get rested. How can you think of sleeping right now, admonished Wren. I've got to try. I don't want to have dark circles under my eyes when I meet the Baron. Quickly, he headed for the stairs. He'd had about as much of their enthusiasm as he could handle for the night. Aren't you going to finish your supper? Called Falcon as Hawk climbed the stairs. Hawk pretended not to hear. Wren waited impatiently until it was true dark before slipping away from the inn. Now that Hawk was going to be recognized by the Baron as an adventurer, it was time for Wren to be recognized as a thief. She had to tell the chief about his son. Even if Sox still wanted to be a fox, at least the chief would know that he was still alive. However, first, she had to get into the guild, which meant she had to find Bruno or Sneak. A cold wind howled against the eaves of the buildings as Wren buried her hands in her hand-me-down sh sh shirt sleeves. There was no sign of anyone in the alley, no faces peering from behind the frost-edged window panes, no one lurking on the streets. Just like everyone, just like everyone to stay indoors when Wren needed help. She headed over to the tavern in hopes that someone she knew would be there. At least the tavern would be out of the wind. She peered inside the barely open door. To her relief, she could see Bruno seated at the crowded table near the bar. He was facing the door, playing some t sort of card game with the butcher and a few men Wren didn't recognize. Unfortunately, Crusher and Berthold were both watching the game. They'd probably throw her out before she could get near Bruno to talk to him. Wren pushed the door open just wide enough to get her hand into the room. She waved at Bruno to catch his eye. She saw him look at her, frown, and shake his head. Then he looked back at the cards in his hands. Wren waved at him again frantically. Bruno ignored her for a moment and then glared back at her. 
Wren pleaded with her eyes and made the thief's sign. Bruno rolled his eyes and threw down his cards, saying something to the others at the table that made them laugh. Then he strode to the doorway, yanked the door open, and barged his way past her, heading for the alley. Wren trotted to catch up with him. All right, snapped Bruno. You pulled me away from a really hot game. This better be good. Wren grabbed at his sleeve, shivering in the icy wind. I'm sorry, Bruno, but I really have to see the chief. More than anything. Bruno jerked his arm away. So what else is new? This time, it's not about me wanting to be a th thief. I know something the chief is going to want to hear. What's the big news, then? Bruno folded his arms, seem seeming irritable but curious. For once, Wren knew something Bruno didn't and the thought made her grin mischievously. I found his son. Bruno gave her a blank stare, then snorted. You found his body, or what? Wren shook her head playfully. No, no, he's alive and well. He's got the cutest kids and everything. Uh-huh, said Bruno, his voice dripping sarcasm. And what exactly does this guy look like who's claiming to be the chief's son? Well, she said teasingly, he's got eyes like mine and red hair. <laughs> he's got such a wicked smile. Bruno smirked. Sorry, kid. The chief's son had dark hair. It's not our guy. It is, Rennie insisted. His hair must have changed color. See, he's kind of different than what he was before. Wren paused for dramatic effect. Bruno just looked at her. He's the fox I was telling you about, said Wren with glee. She wasn't sure, but she thought Bruno looked a little startled. What is your obsession with foxes? He scoffed. It's true, she said firmly. It's just like Barnard the baronet who was turned into a bear. Only Baba Yaga turned the chief's son into a fox. Bruno looked away for a moment watching the wind bang the shutters of the abandoned tannery. For the first time, Wren thought she saw something like uncertainty flicker across his face. Now you know why I've got to talk to the chief, she insisted. Bruno turned back to her, and his face was once again impassive. So what makes you think this fox is the chief's son, he said. He told me so. He could talk a little. He said he needed to talk to his father. I just never figured out what he wanted to say. We got kind of distracted, and then I went to see his new family. He's married a pretty girl fox. I am not making this up, I swear. Talking fox, huh? Said Bruno. He stared into space for a moment, and Wren wished that she could read him better. Well, he said at last, I have to admit that that's too strange a story to be a lie. I'll go talk to the chief about it. As he turned, as he started to turn, Wren grabbed his arm. Bruno stopped abruptly, his eyes boring into her. This time, though, he didn't pull away. Please, Bruno, she said, holding on to his arm with both hands. Let me tell the chief. Bruno removed her hand gently, the leather of his gloves warm against her cold fingers. Sorry, Fox, I just can't do that. Why not? Wren's hands felt twice as cold now. Just go home, he said. Bruno, Wren exclaimed in frustration. Come on, if Sneak can be a thief, why can't I? To Wren's surprise, Bruno stepped closer, so close that the wind sent a the edge of his cloak fluttering against her arm. Slowly, he lifted his hand, and Wren froze as he felt a smooth leather gliding across her cheek. Bruno's hand lingered for a moment on her face, and the warmth seemed to spread over his skin. Fox, he said softly, they don't let girls in the thieves' guild. They don't, said Red, dazed. Then she felt a shock of embarrassment and pulled back. I'm not a girl! You blush like one. Bruno's smile was taunting. Wren hugged herself, feeling the threat of tears prick her eyes. I do not. Listen, Fox, said Bruno, a sudden chill settling into his voice. 
I know that you're not a boy. Can you look me in the eye and tell me you that you are? Wren hesitantly tried to meet his gaze. His flinty expression struck a spark of anger inside her. What difference does it make whether I'm a girl or a boy? It makes a big difference in the Thieves' Guild. Rules are rules. Who cares about rules, said Wren furiously. I could be the best thief ever. I can and I will. Look, kid, said Bruno, there's a point where Spunk quits being cute and starts being annoying. Sometimes you just have to defeat, accept defeat like a man. I am not a man, said Wren, lifting her chin proudly, and I am not defeated. I'll prove it, Bruno. You'll see. Bruno gave her hair a condescending little ruffle. You do that, Missy, he said, and then headed back into the tavern. The wind picked up suddenly, screaming and howling as it rattled shuffle, shutters up and down the street. Then it died, leaving only, only a numbing, bitter cold. Wren turned, blinking away tears, and trudged slowly back towards the inn. And that was that chapter 22, Disappointment. Our next chapter will be 23, By the Book. That is the final chapter. Yes, that is the final chapter. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> Bruno needs to accept defeat like a woman. Bruno doesn't accept defeat very well at all. <laughs>